When we read the story of the Buddha's life, all too often it seems that he was superhuman, engaging in austerities for six years, something we, could, we would never think of doing. It seemed like he was able to give up things as soon as he saw that there would be a, any at least a little bit of harm in doing something, he was able to give it up. But there are other times when he does seem very human. His description of a sense of dismay, seeing the world as a little tiny stream of water with lots of fish fighting one another over that last drop of water. Realizing that everything in the world was laid claim to it, everywhere he would look for happiness that he'd like to take for his own, somebody else had already laid claim to it, or would lay claim to it. And the sense of dismay he felt at that point seems very human. There's another point where someone comes to see Ananda and says this business about the monks giving things up, it seems hard to imagine. So Ananda takes him to see the Buddha, and the Buddha says, even I myself, as I was trying to get the mind into concentration, realizing that to get the mind into concentration I have to give up thoughts of sensuality. My mind just did not leap up at the prospect. So the Buddha, too, had to struggle with the issue of giving up things, letting go of things, sacrificing things. It's a basic principle that, as you said, if you see that there's a greater happiness that's going to come from letting go of a lesser happiness, you should be willing to let go of that lesser happiness. It's a very basic principle. It makes a lot of sense, but it's not all that easy to do. As the Buddha said, part of it was seeing the drawbacks of what he was holding on to. But that's not all. You can see the drawbacks many, many times, and you still don't let go. That's when you have to do a deeper analysis. The Buddha gives you five things to look for. First is just, what is the origination of that mental state? Let's say there's a sexual fantasy or greedy fantasy or thoughts of anger, thoughts of frustration, thoughts of envy. What sparks them? That's the first thing you want to look for. All too often we know these things when they're full-blown, and they seem to make a lot of sense when they're full-blown. They've taken over that much of the mind, that much of the mind's committee. But you want to See them as soon as the first thought comes into one member of the committee. Why does it come? Sometimes you find it's some strange physical sensation of the body kicks in these thoughts. Other times it's when you're tired, other times it's when you're frustrated in one area of life, and so you compensate by pulling out these fantasies where you're more in control, you have more power. But look for that spark. That sets things off. And learn to see it as pretty arbitrary, because these things are arbitrary. You, something happens in that area where it's not very clear whether it's in the mind or in the body. This feeling of dis-ease. And immediately there's an attempt to compensate, and the ways we compensate often have a lot to do with ways we've compensated before. And it goes back, back, back to times when we were pretty stupid, pretty ignorant. But we developed a habit, and the more times you repeat a habit, the more sense it makes. So learn how to look at this as just something that comes, and when it comes it's going to have a cause. See what the spark is. And then also begin to see how these things pass away. Because it's not the case that they're always there. You can be angry for an hour, but are you really angry for the entire hour, or is it just something that comes in bits and spurts, and then stops for a bit, and then you dig it up again and run with it for a while, and then, you, then it dies out? You want to see it dying out, so you begin to realize it's not as scary as you thought. 
It's not as monolithic as you thought, not as big as you thought. Sometimes some thoughts come into the mind and say, do this, and if you don't do it, things are just going to get more and more tense inside the body, more and more intense inside the mind, until you can't stand it and you're going to explode, so you might as well give in now. Well, one of the best ways of counteracting that belief is to watch these things just coming and going and coming and going. The, the going sometimes is pretty random. If something else grabs your attention, you totally forget what the issue, the original issue was, and you're running with something else. So look for that moment of disinterest when it, those things stop. And seeing the arising and passing away of these things gives you an insight that's really important, that they are separate from you. If something really were you, you wouldn't see it arise. Because after all, you'd be arising at the same time. You weren't there beforehand. Or to see something pass away, you realize, oh, it's not me. Because if it were really me, I wouldn't have lasted after it stopped. This helps you see something that the Buddha says is really important. You want to understand things, you have to see them as something separate. Particularly, he says, see these things as aggregates that are something separate. And that's a good way of analyzing things, because the whole terminology of the aggregates it sounds a little foreign sometimes, but it's actually very directly related to how we shape thoughts and run with them and drop them. There's a feeling, say, in the body someplace, and then there's, there's a perception. You slap onto it. And once you've slapped the perception onto it, it gives you something to talk about. And then there's your awareness of all these things. And you want to see the awareness as separate from the other activities. And you break them down into those little activities so that the thought, again, is not so monolithic, it's not so overwhelming. You can cut it down to size. At the same time, you also begin to realize how much effort you're putting into keeping these things going. Because they're ready to drop away at any point, but you stir them up again, stir them up again. So realizing the fact of the effort you put into that then raises the next question, what's the value of that effort? Is it something really worthwhile or not? Because it's a very deep function in our brain is the part of the brain that says, this thing I want to do, is it worth the effort or not? Will the rewards be worth it or not? Because that's what keeps you going back again and again and again. Often they talk about how you, know, you don't understand events going on in the mind unless you dig them. You trace them all the way back to some event in your childhood. But that's not necessarily the case. I mean, tracing it back to an event in the childhood can help you see how arbitrary it was. But if you trace things back in the wrong way, you just say, well, this is the way I am. I've been this way. I've been scarred for life, so I'm going to be continue being scarred. That's not helpful. What you want to see is, why do you keep going back to this habit now? This is where you look for the allure. What's appealing about that kind of thought? And as I said, sometimes the appeal is simply the fact that you're used to it. It's a pattern of thinking that you've been through many, many times. You feel like you're in control because you know where it's going to go. But there are other ways of finding something unskillful, alluring, many of which we're not really honest with ourselves about. We don't like to admit to ourselves that we go for a particular kind of thinking because of the particular kick we get out of it. But if you can calmly ask yourself, what do I look for in this? And you have to look again and again and again to see what the allure is especially if it's the kind that you'd like to hide from yourself. But there will come a time when you suddenly see, oh, I went for this because I thought X. The two thoughts appear together. And the, the allure thought tends to hide very quickly, but if your powers of observation are quick, your alertness is right there. You see this, and when you see how stupid it is, that you don't have to do this. Then you let it go. What's the stupidity? That's the other part of the analysis, is seeing the drawbacks. Where does this particular kind of thinking lead? If you thought or were to think it for 24 hours, where would it lead you? 
Then does it really provide any nourishment? It takes a lot of energy to think a lot of these things. But what do you have to show? And why are you so enslaved to this? When you're thinking about those different kinds of happiness, the ones that you're willing to sacrifice for greater happiness, sometimes you find there's something little that you like and you're not willing to sacrifice it. So you have to look at that very carefully to see the drawbacks of that kind of stubbornness in the mind. And there will come a point, it can't be programmed that you'll analyze this for five times and get the results you want, but there will come a point where you suddenly feel dispassion for the whole thing. In other words, it loses its appeal. When the Buddha analyzes the whole process, he says, dispassion is preceded by disenchantment. Now the word disenchantment means that state of mind you have when you've been eating a certain kind of food and you decide you've had enough, and the idea of eating more of it just does not appeal at all. This corresponds, of course, to the analysis of clinging, which is in which the Buddha uses the same word for clinging as, it, as they use in Pali for the act of taking sustenance for something. You've been feeding on things, and the feeding is suffering. And now you've seen enough so that you don't want any more. When you want to stop feeding, that's when the dispassion comes in. The dispassion then undercuts any motive for continuing to fabricate whatever that was. So this is the process. Look for the arising, or the origination, excuse me, look for the origination, look for the passing away. Look for the allure, look for the drawbacks. And finally, there will be the escape. All of this is motivated by heedfulness. And your desire, as a John Munn says, not to come back and be the laughing stock of the defilements. They see you struggling again and again and again to get out of their power. And they laugh at you because they know you're going to come back. And there's something inside you should say, I don't want to come back again. I've had enough. So a lot of the seeing the drawbacks, in fact, this whole process is one of separating you from whatever it was that was unskillful to get to the point where you can analyze it either simply as something that you're used to identify with and just see it as not self and you let it go, or you actually see it as somebody else in there. There's, the Buddha talks about Mara being inside, and John Mahabha talks about the defilements as if they had a will of their own. And there are ways in which they do. So whatever you can do to separate yourself from them so you can see them. That's something you don't necessarily have to go with, and you don't necessarily identify with. And this step of stepping back and seeing that something separate, that gives you a handle on them. Now, the more you can motivate yourself to do this practice, the more your heart will leap up at the prospect of doing it. And as I said, this sense of realizing that you've been trapped by this. You're stuck in that pool of water, and all you're doing is fighting other fish for that last little gulp, and they're all going to die. That's not just an image for people outside, it's an image for the thoughts in the mind. Your greed says, one more thought of greed. Your lust says, one more thought of lust. There's not even any water there. Or what little water there is certainly not enough to keep you going. And then all these thoughts are going to die anyhow. So why do you want to be their slaves? Why do you, are you willing to be their slaves? And when you can think of the idea of freedom as being something positive, or as the Buddha says, seeing renunciation as rest, seeing renunciation as safety, that's when your heart will leap up. 